that this morning. Well, sorry about that, John. I thought from India. Amen. Uh, we, we are a church. Uh, if you're first time here, we just want to uh, welcome you. Hope that you will just enjoy um, your experience here this morning as we worship the Lord each week like this to kind of open our hearts, open our minds to him, to uh, just hear from his word in a few moments here from Jeff. But it is so, so important to us that we say, come as you are and worship as you feel comfortable worshiping. Uh, we are a church that believes in this motto, which is come as you are, live connected. Living connected has been tough this last year, trying to figure out how do we get in our small groups and how do we live connected in our community, but also being transformed, letting Jesus transform our lives each and every day that we can make a difference and make an impact in our community. So I hope that that is your heart. If you've been here for a while with Journey, uh, I hope that you have begun to find a way, find a place to belong here where you sense that this is a place where God is going to continue to use you, um, come into this place each week to worship him, to open your hearts, to ask him what it is that you want from me. We are imperfect people living in a pretty crazy world. And that's what that song was all about, is just saying, Lord, you are the good father. You are perfect in all your ways. And so we just need to trust that through his perfect will, that our wills can be put aside and let his will be in our lives each day and let his will drive our life each day. And so um, we don't want to continue in worship with a song we probably haven't done in a while, but it talks about the power of Christ and who he is, that we have hope in the power of the cross as we enter into the season leading up to Easter, that you would be just be reminded each day as you're in God's word and as you're learning, being instructed by his word to live a life understanding each day that it's because of the cross that we have life, that we have hope, that we have peace, and that through his mercy, through his grace, that we can find our, through the, in the midst of maybe sorrow and pain that you're going through and craziness, that we can hold on to that hope, that power, and the strength that is only found through him. So let's continue in worship, reminding ourselves of that. can see water's raging at my feet. I can feel the breath of those surrounding me. I can hear the sound of nations rising up. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. I can walk down this dark and painful road. I can face for every fear of the unknown I can hear all God's children singing how we will not be overtaken we will not be overcome the same power that rose Jesus from the grave amen the same power that comes Yeah. 
Praise. Amen. I think you guys all believe that, right? All right. Amen. So many questions the world is reaching. So many hurting. So many lost with all this striving. Who can we lean on? Creation's crying out from the dark. I know the answer to every question, the one solution to every fear. I know my head. sees our sadness, he feels our sorrow, and in our weakness, he is strong. He holds the weight of all of our feelings. Great is our sin, but greater the cross. I know the answer to every question. The i 
that's breaking for every soul that's shaking for every sickness there's healing in your hands let every heart awaken to see it's you who saves us you are my hope and the rock on which i stand you are the answer much as Satan is around, roaring around, just trying to devour and, and disturb people's lives, I pray against the evil one this morning and those evil forces that are out there luring people away from the truth and from their identity of who they are in you. I pray, Lord, that we would stay on that narrow path that you have given us to live. And that th on that path, that you would just continue your great work in our lives. Father, may your will be done in our lives on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you so much for the love that you pour out. We are undeserving of this love. But because of your grace and mercy, we can receive that love openly. Father, we pray for those that are sick this morning that you would heal them. Those that are hurting, that they would sense your peace this morning. Those that have lost loved ones this week. So many people in my life personally on social media that are losing people, great warriors of faith. I think of Luis Palau and his family up in Portland, a dear person here on earth who you so many life-changing things happen because of the work you did in his life as an evangelist. And I just pray for he and his family, or for his family this morning. Pray for him because he's home with you. Amen. That he uh, has received angels' wings. But for the grief that his family's having to go through, but also the joy that they're experiencing knowing that he is at home with you. Loved ones like that, Father, who have been faithful servants here. We just um, ask your blessing upon each and every family that is dealing with the pain and the loss of a loved one. And Father, help us as a church here journey uh, to reach out to those in our community at home here that need you. I think about our homeless folks around here that are needing hope to hold on to. Thank you that journey has been able to reach out. There folks around here that are able to reach into the lives of these folks and, and touch them. Um, thank you for their, uh, the Roseburg mission and the great things that they're able to accomplish day in and day out. And uh, Father, we're grateful for Pastor Jeff this morning and the words that you put on his heart. I pray that you continue to, to lead and guide him, Father, as he uh, leads journey here and uh, the great leadership uh, team of men and women who help uh, bring support to these ministries here. I pray for the heart of this church, Father, to continue to reach out and, and, uh, and do the things that you have called us to do in this community. Again, we're thankful for the love that you pour out into each and every one of us. And we ask this in your son's precious name. Amen. All right, Jason, come on up. Good to see you. And let's not forget the worship team.
They're part of the leadership of this church. They help minister his love in our hearts, our pastor's hearts, and in the hearts of those who come in uh, to see who we are and what we're doing why we're here. Uh, those people we ask to come as you are. How many of you like the new uh, setup in the uh, church, right? Doesn't it look good? Feels a little more normal and home. I mean, at the end of the day, everyone who's online, you know, we miss you. Uh, if you're new to this church and you're not here, we miss you. If you're old to this church and you're not here, we miss you. And, um, you know, I pray for the day when all these seats are, are back to full and we got to figure out where standing room only is. We've got extra chairs around and we can do things. We can actually even add services. Um, but, you know, it's a season. You know, God, uh, God doesn't judge me here today. My judgment happened on the cross that day when his blood landed on that, that dirt there. And it happened for each of us for all of eternity. And so, you know, if you're coming and you want to hear the message of Jesus, you know, we want you to know this isn't about being judged. It's about finding a God who's been waiting for you, who did everything he can to, to have relationship with you in a perfect way. That was the perfect solution to the perfect way. And, um, you know, like God is there waiting for us as a church, we've made the commitment to be here through everything. You know, I, I, I know you guys know what it's like to be a restaurateur because you, you probably think about all the places you like to go eat, you know, or the movie theaters that can't be opened or the cruise ships that haven't left port in a year. You know, and churches are the same kind of environment. It's been very hard for us to uh, navigate that path and find the right place so that we can rub shoulders, love each other, and also be safe and thoughtful and considerate and to all, right? I mean, considerate to all means considerate to all. And um, what a challenging year. And, you know, my prayer is, is that you know, we've been sowing seed for the last year and a half, and these chairs are just going to fill up because people need, they need to know that they're not judged. You know, I, I heard someone say, you know, when you're feeling like you're really bad or you're self-condemning yourself, you want someone to beat you up because it makes you feel better. It makes you feel in line with how you feel. But that's not what Jesus wants for us. He wants us to accept that blood that's on that dirt. 2,000 years ago so that we can just be healed, so that we can actually go on and help someone rather than let people hurt us. And, uh, you know, I think that's what we're here for. Um, we, uh, we've been talking a lot about as a church, so I, I'm just going to share a couple things because it's the season we need to. Um, we're here for people to come as they are, but we really want you to grow into what you're supposed to be. And that doesn't mean you're not what you're supposed to be today, it just means that God's not done, right? He wants to grow us into the, the greatest, strongest, best we can be. And, you know, I think, I think that comes from faith, generosity, and consistency, right? So how can we trust that God's going to make everything in our lives right? Like, it's not going to be easy. We're going to have to, if it's an easy, if it's an easy answer, God's probably not asking the question. Doesn't mean it's not a good question. It just means it's probably not God's, right? And um, so, you know, if we trust that God's going to help us do the things we need to. I moved over here for you guys, by the way, online, because I hear you can't see us over there, and I'm not really sure. But I want to make sure that, that, you know, we can speak to everybody. Um, but, you know, generosity is a really big deal. We want to be able to help everyone in this community that needs to meet Jesus. And there's a lot of things we got to do. You know, we got to fix our bathrooms. Can I hear an amen? Anyone want at least two stalls with two different doors and genders on them? Right? Jeff does. You know, we think we got a budget down to about $30,000. You know, it is what it is, right? To be hospitable, you have to have a space uh, to have people show up. Um, we want to put a patio covering out there. We thought if we go away from wood, 
to like those sales, we can go from maybe 10 or 15 grand down to maybe three to five, right? Um, our youth ministry, we don't have a great youth ministry. What we would like to do for now is have a big van so we can go to other youth ministries with our youth so our youth can go do things together. I mean, isn't that a great idea? Isn't that a good step in the transition? Um, you know, we're on, we, we love that church down in Takati. We want to bring the pastor up to us. And we, he wants a truck down there. We want to send a truck down to him, right? There's just, there's lots of needs. And, you know, when you're a kid, who feeds you and puts a roof over your head? But then as you mature, you start to get your own job. Like my daughter doesn't come around, to, you know, I have her car fixed. She says I can pay for it later because she doesn't have money now. But I pay for it now, right? She's still, you know, that older teen age. And, you know, as a church, we got helped to get started. We're, we're coming up on our six-year anniversary. But our budget's going down by $500 a month. So, you know, is it time for us to say, are we comfortable? You know, after, after talking about this, you know, I was really convicted about this. Am I comfortable with my giving? You know, and the answer is, is yes. And I'm not sure that's a good answer, right? I mean, at the end of the day, I'm just being honest about me. I'm actually comfortable. You know, the whole year, my consistent giving has been the same for, I think, a year now. And, uh, and I am comfortable with it. And that might not be very good, you know. So i got to figure out on the app how to fix it. I don't like figuring out on the app how to fix anything. Um, so, you know, but that's a 21st century challenge, right? You know, we have generosity boxes. If you're like me and don't like fixing it, but I'm not going to fix it at the generosity box. I am going to figure out how to fix it on the app. So, um, but anyway, we just, we just said that to say we love you. We want to grow with you. We want you to come as you are, whether you're whether you've never been in church before, whether you've been living on the streets or you've you've been in terrible relationships or you've you've just done dramatic things. You know, the difference between dead and dead and dead a little bit longer is nothing. It's all dead. Doesn't matter where we came from. What matters is what we're being born into and that's what we're here for. So anyway, I I think that's, oh, and we did have a wonderful men's ministry yesterday. Uh, we had a wonderful testimony. And uh, if you guys haven't come to our men's group every, I think it's the second Saturday of every month, we'd love for you to join us. We have breakfast, fellowship, and, uh, and a testimony. It's really great. Anyway, that's all I got. Come on. It's uh, great to be with you, and um, you know today is uh, out of the out of the out of the calendar year. Uh, daylight savings in spring is the lowest attended Sunday of all year, as if a pandemic isn't bad enough. But no, but <laughs> did you know one of the one of the highest attended outside of Easter, one of the highest attended Sundays is the week after daylight savings? Isn't that strange? Um, I, I'm trying to move things around because I got something hidden back here, and it's still there, fortunately. But uh, I do want to preface this. We're in a series right now talking about defining moments, and it's the idea is we're, we're taking a look at the people Jesus interacted with that um, he would create for them a moment in their life that just changed their lives. And I think it's appropriate because we're heading towards Easter, and for those of you that aren't familiar with how we do things here, we do something called Blossoming the Cross. I always like to prepare people for it, prepare your heart and mind for that Sunday, we will have a live service, obviously, but we'll also have a, a cross out on the uh, on the steps out front where people could, and it should probably be full by, I think, by, um, by service time, but it'll be out there from 6 a.m., and people can come by, and they can, if they're not going to attend in live, or maybe they can come in the morning at sunrise because it means something to them to put a flower on the cross and pray and thank the Lord for his death and then his resurrection, which it's so amazing how that gnarly, ugly cross that we can put flowers on it, because to me, it represents that our God brings dead things back to life. And so I'm just really thankful. So that's really something I want to plug all the time. But we're in this series, and today we're in a topic that, frankly, I'll be honest, I don't like talking about. 
In fact, it's a church that here we have a lot of people that are very new in the faith. And to be honest, this topic is one that is extremely uncomfortable. Jason spent a, quite a bit of time kind of talking about it. And it's about this, all right? You ready? <coughs> My hidden thing here. It's about this. Now, I told you, I hate talking. And I probably shouldn't, but look at me in the eyes for a second. Everybody kind of look up here. Just kind of pay attention. I don't want to catch everybody's eyeballs, okay? So badly do I want to make sure that, especially if you're new to the faith, that you hear me say something, that the purpose behind talking about money, especially when you hear Jesus talk about it, isn't money. The purpose behind talking about money isn't, ne it's never the amount but it's about something very critical. And if there's anything that you get today, it's this, it's this, that it's about your heart. And I so badly pray that everyone here really gets that through their hearts today, all right? So for the purposes of this uh, series, I just want to kind of highlight what it, we're, we're defining, what a defining moment really is. And a defining moment is basically a moment in your life when a truth is, is suddenly out of nowhere revealed, and it's brought front and center in your life, and you're forced to make a de decision. Now, that truth that you are made aware of, it can be a truth that you once knew but forgot. It can be a truth that you once knew but you just lost sight of, or you, maybe you walked away from. Or it can be a truth that you never knew before, and all of a sudden it's brand new, and in a moment that truth becomes so glaring, it becomes so bright and even uncomfortable that in that moment, but oh, it's so powerful a, a truth, you wake up. You, you're suddenly, it's like smelling salts to your soul. Suddenly, you know what you're hearing or what you experienced or what you're reading or whatever it is that where the, uh, the venue of that, of that truth came to you. You know that what you're hearing, experiencing, have read is true. And it's so defining a truth that it literally forces you to transform. It forces you to make a decision. And the question is always, do I embrace this truth and fully be transformed, or do I bury this truth, hide from it, ignore it, and hopefully that transformation, which they really want, will just happen at a later time, maybe all by itself? How often does that happen? Right? <clears throat> And, of course, defining moments, we know they can happen in our marriage. Um, they can happen in parenting kids and raising kids. Uh, they can happen in all, any relationship. They can happen in your finances. They can happen in your money. Uh, they can happen from a near-death experience. How many of you have had a defining moment from a near-death experience? How many of you have had a, a defining moment where maybe it was decades after a traumatic childhood experience? And all of a sudden, truth is revealed in a powerful way, and you can now never be the same again. <clears throat> so defining moments are all throughout our lives, but I also have been saying that the defining moments we're really looking at specifically from Jesus' interactions are spiritually defining moments. And a spiritually defining moment is, you, you know, you, you look at those moments, especially when you watch Jesus interact where God, ha either through an interaction or maybe you, you've had an interaction with Jesus or with faith, or maybe you had an inter interaction with a person of faith or an experience or a, or a scripture that you read or a circumstance. And, and in, that, in that interaction, the, uh, some powerful truth of God was revealed. And, and that truth Maybe it was a truth that you, you, know, you were brought up believing, but then you just walked away from and you became an adult. You, know, you entered adult world. Or maybe it was a truth that you just never knew was true about God. You just learned and believed the wrong thing about God your whole life. And all of a sudden, in a moment, everything changes. And now um, you're suddenly forced with that transforming truth and, and to, to make a spiritual decision. And so as we see in this series, that Jesus was sent to earth for more 
for the sins of the world and for your sins personally. He was actually sent to earth for another general overarching purpose, and that is to reveal what God is really like to the world. And so if you read the New Testament, especially the Gospels, you see Jesus' interactions with person after person after person, men and women all over the world. He was just continually meeting people, and he was delivering to them these defining moments where he was revealing truth about who God was in ways they had either not really known or they knew but buried. And in those moments and in those conversations, especially at the moment when when you're in a defining moment spiritually, usually it's quite uncomfortable. And there's a light that's like of the truth of God is so bright and it's so hard for you to stand in that moment. It causes you to squint. It makes you want to run away as soon as you're, you know, forced to be in the light of this brand new truth. And typically, if you look at the interactions with Jesus, when Jesus would bring these defining spiritual moments to people, those people, those men, those women would stand in that blinding light sometimes and they'd wait and they wouldn't run away. And you know when you're in a blinding light, it takes time for your eyes to begin to adjust. And finally, they began to embrace that truth, and they were forever changed. And then there are some people in that blinding light situation where be, the, the truth of God was being revealed to them. It was just too much for them. And they would run away, back to the darkness. So today, today's interaction is with a young man, Uh, Maybe a single man, we don't know, probably a single man, a wealthy guy, and uh, this is a story in the New Testament that's actually commonly titled the rich young ruler, even though that's not really in the text itself, but translators have just kind of thrown that title above that little section of scripture. We're going to be in Mark chapter 10, and oh, nice. I thought, did we pay our bills? (laughs) But uh, what else is interesting is, is um, this story is actually included in three of the four Gospels, which means it was a prominent story. It was a big story, but I've got to tell you, I've always been really frustrated by one detail about this story that isn't in there, and that's the guy's name. He isn't named in all three of these stories that are included in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke. And I'm the kind of guy that sits around, and maybe you have jobs and lives and families and kids and stuff, and don't think about this stuff like I have to, because I'm a pro, I'm, I'm a professional person, I have to do this. So, But I think, you know, how in the world did this get that way, where we've got three people that included a prominent story about a guy, and, none, and, and he's not named one time. I have, I, I'm, at the very end of our message today, I'm going to give you my take for why he isn't named. All right? And it's just my guess. I think it's a good guess. But we'll talk about that at the end. But this is a young guy. He's a wealthy guy. And he's got the world on, the pla- on his platter. He just has everything. And yet, he's got this burning spiritual question. And I guess no one can help him answer it. You know, and Jesus comes on the scene and he sees uh, this Jesus walking around, creating defining moments for people left and right all over Israel. And he decides to leverage his, I don't know, wealth, his leverage his influence and power to go intercept Jesus on a road. And and he decides he wants to ask Jesus his burning spiritual question. All right? So Mark chapter 10, that's where we get in the story, verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, which wasn't too uncommon. People run up to Jesus all the time. But this guy was wealthy. That's a little weird to see a wealthy Young man, run up to Jesus. So he's running up to Jesus, and this time he fell on his knees, and that wasn't too common either. Only a couple people would do that, had done that to Jesus. But he falls on his knees before Jesus, and he said, this is very strange, he says, good teacher. We'll talk about that in a second. Good teacher, he asked, and here's this burning spiritual question. What must I, keyword, do? What must, and actually it's, what must you do to inherit eternal life? That's his burning question. And that's a great question. Don't you think? I think it's a fantastic question. And I think he's saying basically, look, I'm wealthy, I'm rich, I'm set up for a problem. 
long, enjoyable life like nobody else. And frankly, I'm at least aware that it can't live forever. So I want to know how to hedge that bet. I'm a businessman. I'm used to planning ahead. So I'd like to hedge that bet and find out how to set myself up for, you know, later. This is a good question, right? In other words, Jesus, I just, how can I know that I know? Okay, how can I know that I just know that when I die, I'll be okay? This is a great question. And I love it because as set up for life as he was, somehow at night when he laid in his bed, he had an uncertainty. He had a lack of assuredness. He wasn't confident. He wasn't confident that he knew what he knew, what he needed to do so that he can be absolutely assured that he had successfully reserved himself a place in heaven. And of course, typical, Jesus, when you ask Jesus a question, just a little warning, a little caution, you might get the answer to an unasked question, okay, if you ask Jesus a question. So, Here's what Jesus, he answers, typical. He starts with this topic that he brought up about good teacher. He says this, why do you call me good? Jesus answered. Now, it's interesting. He picks up on the little Greek phrase that the man used in his question when he got Jesus' attention. He used that phrase, good teacher, to get his attention. And and the Greek phrase um, he used, if you understand... It meant that the guy was saying more than, I believe Jesus teaches gooder than other people. What that little Greek phrase actually implies is, no, uh, is that that I believe Jesus was gooder than other people. Okay? Big difference. But he's, he's, Jesus hears him use that phrase, good teacher, and he, and he picks up on it and says, okay, well, first let's just start with, You know, this, why do you call me good? And then he says this. He gives him this idea. And this is an important idea. And I think after he said this, there was a long, uncomfortable pause. In fact, by the way, if you're ever reading scripture, especially the narratives where people are talking and there's back and forth, it really helps if you just slow down and you just read it with pauses, okay? It really brings it to life. But I think after he said this, there's a long pause, but he looked at the man and he said this idea that was so key. And actually, the conversation and the rest of it could have been finished if, it had, if he had paused long enough and internalized this thought right here. But he looks to him and he says, okay, here's an idea first. No. That's got to draw a little uncomfortable thought. Why do you call me good? No one is good. Except God alone. And you can just imagine this. There was just a long pause. And of course, he's probably going, um, okay, I asked a question here. I mean, an eternal life question. And Jesus is like, okay, but no one is good but God alone. And, and, and I think that obviously it's baiting two different thoughts. Because the guy used good teacher to address Jesus, right? And of course, Jesus with this is going, okay, wait a minute. First, does he really think I'm God? Because oh, maybe if he paused and thought about this idea, he might become aware of whose presence he's actually standing in. Who's the guy going around Israel creating this defining moments for people left? People's lives are being transformed. Does this guy maybe actually believe I'm something more than just a teacher? Good thought. Or if you ponder long enough on this question, that no one is good except God alone, and that maybe you're standing in that God's presence, really, that's who you're with right now. You know, for me, if I was standing in the presence of God, and I knew I could only do that if I were good, equally as good as him, I might ask the question myself, how in the world? I mean, it might not be, um, you know, how do I get, what do I do to inherit eternal life? I might be just saying something like, can you give me some, whatever help I need to make it, eternal life happen? All right. I just think that there was this long, awkward pause, and it's clear that the rich young ruler's not, not getting it. 
And, of course, he's just saying, I asked the question, okay, what do I do, Jesus, though? And I think Jesus sighs and realizes he's not, he's not really with it. And he says, okay, well, okay, what do you do? What do you do? Okay, well, let's just tell him, okay? You know the commandments, okay? In other words, well, you know the answer to your own question, okay? And understand at this point, Jesus, I think, knows all he needs to know. He knows that this man's not really willing to ponder the idea that he's standing in the presence of goodness, of perfect goodness, and that he would actually need to have a relationship with that person in order for his question to be answered. And he knows, you know, like many of us, we just want God to just tell us what to do, right? Just notice, just give me, give me the system. I just want to know the system. I want to, you know, learn the method. I want to get the routine down. I want to work. And of course, he's wealthy. He's used to getting what he wants. He wants a relationship with God that's really about a system because the system really keeps control in his hands, right? The system really is something that he, so Jesus, just tell me what I need to just do and I can get from God what I want to get. And here's the problem, by the way, with a system. You know, the, the problem with a the system, there's three problems. Number one, when you have a system of a relationship with God, basically you, it, it turns God into an idol is what it does. It's a turns God, it turns God into a, into a God that you use instead of a God that you know. And that's the second problem. If you, if you ever have a system to have a relationship with God, intimacy is gone. Your ability to have a relationship is also gone. Try to have a relationship with someone who's all about following the rules. It's hard. In fact, it can only go so deep. And the third problem is, you know, this is once you, if there were a system to being in a relationship with God, and there was a, a bunch of rules, if I told you that you had to do this, 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 and this, and this eight things, that if you just follow these rules, you would do, and I would do, the absolute minimum to make those happen. You know that? It's true. We would do the absolute minimum to have a relationship with God. And if you want to fire Jesus up, go start asking him questions about minimum requirement spirituality. And he's not going to enjoy those topics very much. So, so Jesus, he's, he's, gonna, he's getting ready. He says, you know the commands. You know, you, you know all the And here he begins to rattle them off. He says, you know, they shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not, you shall not defraud, you shall not for, uh, honor your father and mother. And I, I think personally, Jesus was going on and on. I think Mark just stopped, you know, writing it down. I think that the guy saw that Jesus was just going to name them all, right? Because he could. So could just about any other Hebrew Sunday school kid that grew up. Because that was the system, by the way. Did you know that growing up in their Hebrew school system, little kids would be told all the commands. They'd actually be required by age 12 to memorize them. And once they had pat them on the head and say, good little Jewish boy. And that God believes you are good now. That's the system. In fact, he says that in just a second. Because the guy's like, stop. Okay, I hear you're going to wrap of the 330 or 605 commands that are in the Old Testament. But no, no, don't tell me those systems. Don't tell me those commands. He goes, teacher, all I was a boy. And he's not being arrogant here. He's just t saying back what every Hebrew ch child was told their whole life. And in fact, it's, the system was, you know, you follow the rules and you're good, and, and rabbis would constantly tell you you were good, and it would kind of work into a control thing. The rabbis would control behavior, and it just was this control system. But it really, especially not just for kids, but it worked especially for wealthy people. Because ra rabbis would follow to constantly tell wealthy people that they were good. If for those of you who have, don't you know that's true? Everybody laughs at all. Right? Everybody thinks you're great. No, nope. you really need to hear what they really need to tell you. Because when the rabbis who really have, want access to your money, they got to tell you that you're good. So, I mean, he had people his whole life. 
as a boy, people have been telling me I'm good. And I got rabbis crawling on my back every day telling me I'm good. You're good, you know. So Jesus, he's like looking at him, don't tell me the loopholes. Don't tell me that system. I got that system working. I'm, I'm coming to you because all I know is that although I do that, and although they say that, and all these people tell me that I'm good, all I know deep down is somehow I lack this certainty. I lack an assuredness that I actually have eternal life. Can you help me? And I absolutely love, 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 love this verse. In fact, um, I've been in ministry for 25 years, and I, I came across this little verse about eight months ago, and I'd never seen it before. And I think this is partly why this, this story is included in three of the four Gospels, this next verse. It's one sentence. I absolutely love this one. If I could, if I could reel you all in before we start talking about money and talking about th this stuff, this is the verse that's meant for you today. Even if, even if you came in here for great other reasons and you were disappointed that we are going to be talking about money today, I'm telling you, there's someone in here, there's someone watching online that this next sentence was designed for you today in your personal context. The guy lacks his assuredness and he looks at Jesus. And Jesus looked at him, it says, and loved him. End of sentence. Now, that line is not in the other two stories. And the book of Mark, for the, the book of Mark was a gospel, it was the first one written. And actually, it was written by Mark, but it was mostly a compilation or a dictation of Peter's sermons that he went around sharing after the resurrection. And Mark was the one following down, and not only he would, he would document the things that Peter would be saying, and then when he sat down with Peter, a lot of... So basically, the gospel of Mark is Peter's, um, Peter's gospel in many ways. But it's, if you're writing this story, this little narrative, it's a little back and forth conversation, and all of a sudden, you had to stop the narrative and write a commentary sentence. And that one sentence was this, and Jesus looked at him and loved him. How would you observe that? What would that look like? If you thought there was a long pause when he asked, you know, why do you call me good? I think this was a tremendously, un incredibly, awkwardly long, long pause where there was far more than just silence going on. I think he grabbed the guy by the shoulders and he looked him deep in the eyes. And he didn't stop into his eyes until he was looking back into his eyes deep. And, they, and, and there was nothing but love. It, is, it just says his heart, Jesus' heart just went out to him. And, and, and he doesn't mock him. He doesn't get angry that the guy's, you know, not tracking with where Jesus was hoping he would track with. He just is, and by the way, he's getting ready to dump the dump truck on him. He's getting ready to reveal the defining moment truth in his life that's going to that's gonna be so blinding. And in fact, he's going he's gonna to offer this guy a, an, an opportunity that he only offered to 12 other people and a couple others in his ministry. He's going to offer him the chance of a lifetime in just a second. But before he does, he looks at him deep in the eyes and he loves him. And then he tells him, there's one thing you lack. And he said, I want you to sell it all. I want you to give it all away. I want you to give it all away. Just go sell it and give the proceeds to the poor. And then you'll have treasure in heaven. And then I want you to come and follow me. 
He only gave that offer to 12 people. He was offering him to come into his inner circle. And of course, the guy came that day and said, no, 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 really, I just want eternal life. You know, I, I just want, just the little things, you know, I just want eternal life. I wanted some other little hidden, you know, secret cryptic law. Oh, because Jesus, you're creating defining moments all over Israel. I'm sure you know that if there's some additional little cryptic secret law that I know that works into the system, that I know that you would be able to tell me that one thing. I could just move on from here and just keep going. Just tell me that one little system thing. And, 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 and what, that's all he wanted. But you know what, what Jesus wanted is Jesus wanted nothing more when he was staring deeply in his eyes for him to lock eyes back to him and just love him back. Just give it all and love him back. And he wanted him to follow him. In other words, loving him back is manifested. It's manifested in fellowship. He wanted him to follow him. And, and I think it's because Jesus knows that above all else, above all else, God wants almost nothing, nothing more than in the world than he wants is our love, our loyalty, and our fellowship. It's about a relationship. In fact, G day, uh, at the end of Jesus' ministry, you know, Jesus does a really a better job, in my opinion, answering this rich young ruler's question. In the last night of Jesus' life, when he's with the 12 disciples that could have been 13, but he's with the 12 and he's praying just hours before he's crucified and he's praying out loud and John this time is recording it and when, G when he records this, here's what Jesus prays out loud. I wish the rich, rich young ruler was here for this, this one thing Jesus prayed. Jesus says out loud, God, and of course, I wish the rich young ruler was here. Of course, he wasn't prepared to hear it even if he was and I told him this was the answer that he needed to hear. He probably wasn't prepared to hear it that day anyway because he just had too much wealth. But it's, he's like, last a few hours of my life, and it's just these 12 disciples, and it's now or never. I'm going to tell them something. He said, now this is eternal life. And here it is, that they know you. That they know you. Knowing is eternal life. And I mean deep, like, relational knowing. The kind of knowing that you can only get from following. Kind of knowing, right? And then he says this, knowing the only and Jesus Christ. That's eternal life. Knowing the only true God and Jesus Christ. Whom he has sent. And when he spoke to the, the rich young ruler, you know, he, it, was, it was amazing. He, he, he was, in, in effect, just, just looking at him face to face, loving him deep in his eyes, and, and trying to tell him, your question about the eternal life is the greatest question you can ever ask. But let me tell you, eternal life is not a destination. It's not a destination. And you don't get there by a system. It, it, eternal life, it's all about knowing. It's all about, eternal life is all about a relationship. It's all about, um, it, it's all about knowing God. You want eternal life? He says, I'm, I need you to lay it all down. I need you to begin a relationship that's marked by undying fellowship with me. And I want you to even join my inner circle. And I want you to get me, to know me so well like you've never known anybody in your, in your whole life. I want you to know me. Because eternal life is not a system. It's not a routine. It's not a method. It, it's not a destination. It is a relationship characterized by love, characterized by loyalty, commitment, and fellowship. And, and, and so it's, I think staring in this man's eyes, I think grabbing him by the shoulders in this awkward, awkward, long moment, he's looking him li literally in the eyes. And I believe Jesus is just pleading in his soul, love me back. Give it all. Love me back. Love me back. Love me back. You know, and he just... And this is the man's defining moment. Do you understand at this point that this is not about money? I hope so. Because this is the man's defining moment. And, and in this defining moment, he is about to discover something about himself. 
uh, he's, he's about to discover that his primary ambition in life is not to have the answer to the question he asked. He's about to discover that his primary ambition in life was to learn how to work the system and to use God to get God in a fake relationship to do what he wants so he can keep control. So the story ends. At this, the man's face slowly fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. In that defining moment, he discovered there's something more than eternal life than he wanted. There's something more than knowing God, or there's something more than a relationship with God that he wanted. And in this defining moment, he really realized, because he had great wealth, that, that actually he doesn't own wealth. Did you know that he discovers that his wealth owned him? Right? Jesus, I'm sorry, I just have too much stuff to follow you. So, is anybody here uncomfortable with talking about this? And again, again if I can, today's message is not about this as much as it is. But let's just be, kind of turn the corner and kind of close this idea with a bunch of thoughts, okay? The reason why this story is in the gospel is because I believe Jesus is just unafraid to say, you know, this idea that, number one, he knows that nothing competes for your spiritual life than your wealth. I think it's absolutely true. I, I'll give you a case for it in just a second, but if you if you realize, Jesus creates this defining moment for this man because he knows that the day is going to come where if it ever came down, you would choose to either love this or maybe just love Jesus and just give it all if he asks and give it away and gain fellowship, gain that personal relationship with God and gain a relationship. And by doing so, Jesus' definition, you're gaining eternal life. And he knows, Jesus knows there's nothing that creates more uh, like, a, like a quicker defining moment than when your heavenly father asks you to consider dispensing some of this. Instantly, it's like there's nothing better to determine where you are with God. And in this cringeworthy moment, you know, the bl it's blinding, it's uncomfortable, and it's something, like I said, if you're a new person following Jesus for a short period of time, I am really slow as a pastor to shove this in front of you because it's that cringeworthy. It's hard. But in the moment where you're forced to, to cringe, you are in a blinding, uncomfortable, defining moment where you learn some things about yourself and you learn some things about God. And, and here's some things. Number one, here's the stuff we all know, basic stuff. Number one, God doesn't need your money, right? We know this to be true. God doesn't need your money. He, in fact, the, the text even says, like Jesus said, just go liquidate everything, and I don't need it. Just give it away. Give it to someone else, okay? Because it really isn't about the dollars. God doesn't need your dollars. He, in fact, it's, you know, so it's not. He just says, give it away. Move it out of the way is his thought. But we do know this, that your money reveals your heart, and Jesus wants us to know this. And why money? Well, money is a, let me just ask this question, a more vivid uh, element to your life that can like instantly reveal where you are with God doesn't exist. You know, people say, well, well I'd rather, you know, learn the morals or I'd rather just give my time to God or I'd like to give my service. You know, I can serve with my hands. I can serve with my morals. I can choose to be a good person. But you know, all of those things, time, service, morals, they're all wrapped up in the system. You can fake that. But, but this is like a litmus test the moment it comes up, isn't it? This is like, oh my goodness. It's the one immutable element that is the pathway to your heart. Instantly you find out where you are with God. Okay? So a better, a better um, revealer doesn't exist. And of course, we all know that's true because we all have had, been in relationships. God wants uh, this to be a reflection of your love for him. And so when, um, when people are in love, how, does that, how do their finances work? Okay? What, do, what do in love people's finances look like? Right? 
It, I remember this. I'm in love with my wife. And if she ever needs anything, man, even when I was, I used to be a youth pastor making $600 a month, okay? We lived in, in um, we lived in HUD housing in Salem as college students. I think, what was our, our rent was 120 bucks a month. And we barely had anything. And if she ever wanted anything, I, I would do anything. I would blow the budget, what little budget we had, and I would make it happen and figure it out later. And I would still do that. I really think, my wife really is so awesome. She doesn't really ever ask for much. So it's, a, it's tremendous. But I, I still love her, and if any, there's anything she ever needs, I want to get that for her. I, that's what in love people do, because in love people are generous towards one another. I still need to fix things that, I got like a list of things I'm supposed to buy still, and it's just, it's not because I don't love her, but just, I just need time. Like I got to fix her poor, if you guys look at her car, someone drove by her house and knocked off the driver's side mirror. It's been like that for two years, and <laughs> I'm so sorry, but I'm going to do that now. This week, I'm going to buy that and put it on for her. But so in the, in the meantime, I found one of these chintzy things I found at one of those, um, it was, at, it was in a secondhand store. And I was like, oh, that's like a little RV rubber band strap-on one. You could just use that for two years. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, if I'm not willing to spend the money, that, that says something about my love for her. Because in love, people are generous. You just spend the money, figure it out later, you, you, you know, and so on. And also... In love, people prioritize. They prioritize their time. They, when you're, you you prioritize your spending categories. And basically, when, when you are in love, you prioritize spending categories that affect this relationship first, and all other spending categories come second. Because that's what in love people do. And now some of you, like I said, are not followers of Jesus yet, and some of you are. Some of you already would consider yourself tithers, okay? You give 10% and whenever, how much ever more off the top. You do that. And, and let me just warn you, though, in case you didn't know, wherever you are in the spiritual journey, today's message is to point out that if you follow Jesus from time to time, you will get a defining moment regarding your stuff. And I should be less afraid as a pastor to tell you that. Really. Really. And in those moments, the reason why is because in those moments, you begin to discover that an issue is never about the amount of money. The issue is never about that God needs your money. It's always about this, that God knows that nothing competes for the ownership of your heart like stuff and money. So from time to time, Jesus will come in. I believe at the perfect time, he'll look deeply in your eyes until you look deeply back into his until you understand it's not about money. But he will in those moments say, I want you to dispense this out of your love for me. So, and of course, at the church here, like I could, I know pastors that really kind of get everybody emotionally and say, well, I'm going to start giving, and then they start throwing down all the different projects and t tell you, and I don't like even doing that because my worst fear is that you would walk away thinking this is about the projects. Like our, pro I can tell you, we got tons of them. I could lay them on you. We, in fact, Jason kind of hit a bunch of them. You know, we've got five hundred do dollars a month that's going to be dropping out of our budget because we've been supported from an outside ministry that's ending this month. So we really could use everyone in this church to either increase your giving by a dollar or two, or if you've never given before, we'd like to have you ch challenge you to start at thirty nine ninety nine a month or whatever. You know, you can have whatever you do, but we just, we just want to get your foot in the door and say, you know what, you should start giving lately. And, and we could tell you we need bathrooms. We really hope that we can get it down below $30,000. You know, all kinds of stuff. We, we, we want to build this patio. I personally think we can get it down under $5,000. So and there's all kinds of projects and purposes. But with, when I get you all riled up and you say, okay, I'm going to give, let me just ask you, giving to the bathrooms, is that going to save a soul from hell? because we did our bathrooms. Is it going to save a soul from hell because we put up a patio cover? Is it? No? Yes? Maybe? I don't know. Possibly. But what your money does 
to do that isn't the point. The point is when Jesus looks you in the eye until, until you realize he loves you, the point is you loving him back and you give it. It's between you and Jesus. I mean, the, the church down in Takate, they want a truck. We need to get Pastor Moy up here. That we might have to hire an immigration lawyer. Uh, all kinds of crazy stuff. I need, I need to work with the staff. We'd love to hire people. You know, we were, we're trying to buy this building. You know, this building, uh, you want any details on that? The details, this building's the owner would love to sell it for $1.2 million for the whole block, everything on the block except for actually a strip of land that goes the length of this building belongs to somebody at Dillard. They want to sell it to us for eighteen grand. But th- they, they want to sell that. And, and this year is the year that our owner of this property has said five years ago that they'd be willing to consider selling it to us this year. And I'll just tell you where we land with that. We don't, because remember, it's not about the project. But it, it basically, um, we need to have a, a down payment amount in our bank account over and above our expenses in order for us to get that loan if we need to buy the building. Or I'll tell you what would be a better scenario for our owner. He would much, 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 much prefer not for us to buy the building from him and to drop a whole bunch of cash into his um, into his income in, the, in 2021 and have him taxed into oblivion for it, okay? He would much prefer somebody is listening online or somebody in this room who knows a guy that wants to be super generous to the kingdom or either donate or let us buy an, a like property like this here in the area, and he would much prefer us doing a 1031 exchange so that he doesn't get killed by the finance. Okay, that's the details. I just throw it out there. But again, some people are like, whoa, 1.2 million, that's a lot of money. And some are like, well, I got that in my pocket. No, but there's like, it doesn't, not really. But the amount isn't relevant. The amount, it's never about the amount. It's not the amount. It's not even the project. It's not even the impact that you make by giving. It is always, always, always a matter of your heart because at the moment Jesus looks at you and says, I want you to dispense some of this, you begin to discover whose you are. Do you own stuff or does your stuff own you? And this is hard. It's hard at every level too, by the way, because when you, when you, when you don't have a job and you got $10 for babysitting, it's easy to take a dollar out, right? right? And it's a little harder now when you, when you got that lawn mowing job and you made that $100 to pull a 10 out, right? And it gets harder from there when you make your first 1000 <coughs> And especially if you're young, you're like, holy cow, I could go, I could go night skiing with this, <laughs> you know, 100 bucks or whatever. And it gets really, you start going up from there, you get 10000 and you have to give <laughs> Or, and it's really hard, but, but every, every step of the way, at every level, you always constantly learn when it comes, and Jesus pushes a defining moment before you, you always be, discover whose you are. Does your stuff own you, or do you, are you owned by your stuff? Or I think I've said that two times the same way. You know what I meant. So, I think it's really important that uh, we internalize that what Jesus wants most is he wants you to follow him, all right? Now, let's just end. I'll, I'll just tell you what I think happened to this guy. We don't know what, what, what happens to this rich young ruler after these three times they show up in all the Gospels. And the fact that he's not named ask me, you know, makes me want to ask the questions. Just to let you know, when I'm reading through, especially the Gospels, I love to ask a single question that leads me into a lot of cool study, and it's this. How did we get this story? How did we get this story? Like, for example, the woman at the well. We talked about that. The disciples all went in. It was just Jesus. When we had this long, super detailed, incredibly in-depth conversation, but the only people there was Jesus and the woman. Where did all the details come from? Right? Or you talk about Pilate, for example. He gets, you know, whipped, and then Jesus pulled in, and Pilate has this conversation in a private quarters with him where no one else is listening. How did we get that detail? Incredible detail in that conversation. 
Well, this question I like to ask, number one, how do we get this story? Why is it in all three Gospels, and why isn't the guy named in all three? And in short, I just want to tell you, because I think that later, after the re resurrection, maybe, or maybe because I don't think he ever got over that look Jesus gave him, I think he came back. And I think he gave it all. That's my take. And his generosity... I believe it became a legend after the resurrection. I think it became this reason he's discreetly not named, too. And I think he's not named due to the fact that he had prominence, he had power, he had wealth. And for the sake of anonymity, it was wise for all three of the people to just leave his name off. But I think when everyone read it, they all knew exactly who this person was. Because his giving and his generosity if it happened, would have become legendary for the beginning initial movement of Christ after the resurrection. But the Bible, the reason why this story is in the, in the Gospels three times, it's for you and me. It's for, it's for us. Because I believe that Jesus knows that at the end of our lives, we'll have to either say, you know, Jesus, you brought me to defining moment after defining moment, after defining moment regarding my stuff until finally I saw that you were looking at me in a way I couldn't ignore anymore and loving me. And so I finally decided to dispense this for your kingdom because I loved you back. And tragically, he knows that some will say, you know, Jesus, I, I know you brought me to defining moment after defining moment regarding this and the tragic truth is instead of giving this to you I decided to love this and leverage this for myself and use you nobody wants that I wouldn't want that for anyone let's pray Father thank you so much that um, wow we just brought to you a truth out of scripture that I as a pastor want to be gentle with people as it's presented and I know that you weren't shy to talk about it so, Jesus, as an obedient pastor, I, I present the truths that hopefully are defining moments to everyone listening. That it isn't about money, it isn't about that, it's literally a, the, one of the greatest tests of where you are to determine whose you are. And so, Jesus, I want to uh, leave it there and let people and let the Spirit of God just dwell on people right now and move people right now to do and to respond, not to bury the truth, but to come alive and to trust that something in this is meant to transform them in a powerful, powerful way, whether it's adding to giving or whether it's to trying out giving for the first time or whether it's I, God's telling you you need to give a property. I don't know what you, God's telling people, but Lord Jesus, I pray that you would, you would by your spirit, you would lay it upon all of our hearts to sense that we have been brought to a defining moment that is not about the amount, it is about our heart, Lord Jesus. Amen. It's in your name we thank you. Amen. A couple weeks to, e to Easter. I'm super excited about it. We got, and I, um, I think I got two more messages, then we have Easter. And I'm super, super excited about the next couple messages coming up. So um, we'll see what happens next week. Like I said, next week is one of the highest attended Sundays out of the year, and we do have room for those of you watching online with lots of extra space left over. So, but until then, may I urge you to follow Jesus because we believe here that finding and following Jesus is the greatest journey. Have a great